And with people like him, we began this campaign with information. What is your assessment of President Obama? If I take a shift from how confused and how complicated the politics of this country is, I would have to first of all say that the fact that the collective power of the voters of this nation among all of its citizens should have chosen to elect him as the president of the United States says something about America's deeper resonance. Where really lies Americans, America's passion? What does its citizens really hope for? Having said that, I must then say that uh, uh, I'm somewhat dismayed that there has not been a greater revelation of the use of his power uh, to make choices, not only for legislation, but for public discourse and debate in a greater way than he has availed us of. And I'm reminded very quickly of a story uh, sitting with Eleanor Roosevelt told us one night up there in Hyde Park at a dinner. We loved, we reveled in her stories. And she told me, told us the story of her husband and his first meeting with a great powerful labor leader named A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Uh, a job that was quite menial, but very critical to the American railway system. And she loved A. Philip Randolph and his intellect and his evaluations as a union organizer. And in bringing him to the White House for dinner, invited A. Philip Randolph to tell the president his view of the state of the union from the Negro perspective and from the perspective of the black workers. And uh, as a great mind and thinker, and very much engaged, uh, A. Philip Randolph held forth. And Roosevelt listened very carefully and was very stimulated by what Philip Randolph had to say. At the end of that moment, uh, A. Philip Randolph was waiting for a response. And Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said to him, of course, paraphrasing, Mr. Randolph, I've heard everything you have to say, the way in which you've criticized the fact that I have not used the, the power of my platform sufficiently in the service of the workers of this nation, and particularly the Negro people, that I didn't use my bully pulpit more vigorously. And I cannot deny that that may be the case. As a matter of fact, I believe that is the case. And in that context, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor. And that is, if that is so, I'd like to ask you to go out and make me do what you think it is I should do. Go out and make me do it. And when you ask me about Barack Obama, it is exactly what happened to Kennedy. We, the American people, made the history of that time come to another place by our passion and our commitment to change. What is saddened, what is sad for this moment is that there is no force, no energy of popular voice, popular rebellion, popular upheaval, no champion for radical thought at the table of the discourse. And as a consequence, Barack Obama has nothing to listen to except his detractors and those who have paved the way to his own personal comfort with power. Power contained, power misdirected, power not fully engaged. And it is our task to no longer have expectations of him unless we have forced him to the table and he still resists us. Then if he does that, then we know what else we have to do. It is to make change completely. But I think he plays the game that he plays because he sees no threat from evidencing concerns for the poor. He sees no threat from evidencing a deeper concern for the needs of black people as such. He feels no great threat from evidencing a greater policy towards the international community, for expressing thoughts that criticize the American position on things and turns that around. Until we do that, I think we'll be forever disappointed 
and what that administration will deliver. And to those who say, if you want President Obama reelected, you will undermine him if you criticize him and consider the alternative? I think we will not only undermine him, but undermine the hopes of this nation if we don't criticize him. Absence of protest in the times of this kind of national crisis. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt once says, when tyranny takes over the national uh, agenda, it is that time that the voices of protest must be awakened. And if you don't raise your voice in protest, you are a patriotic traitor. traitor. And uh, I believe that patriotism is betrayed by those voices that are not heard. Those who would detract you from that fact are those who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Nothing will happen but good for Barack Obama and the United States of America and indeed the world if everybody stepped to the table and said, this is the course we must be on. Have you let President Obama know your views? You've been with him. Every opportunity I've had to put that before him, uh, he has heard. I have not had a chance to put it to him as forcefully as I would like to because he has not yet given us the accessibility to those places where this could be said in a more articulate way and not always on the fly. But uh, he once said something to me during his uh, campaign for the presidency and he says, uh, he said, you know, I said, I've heard you, he was talking before businessmen on Wall Street here in, here in, uh, uh, there in New York. And uh, he said to me, uh, I said, uh, I thought, well, you know, I, I hope you bring the challenge more forcefully to the table. And he said, well, when are you and Cornell West going to cut, cut me some slack? I got caught with that remark. And I said to him, and we I said, what makes you think we haven't? And the truth of the matter is that we were somewhat contained even in the extent to which we criticized him during the campaign in the hopes that it would energize his capacity to get elected. And that once he was elected, that burden would be off his back and he would use this new platform to do things other than what we have been experiencing. And I think any further retreat from bringing truth to power and forcing him to hear the voice of the people would be a disservice to this country and all that it promises to be. Harry, the